Well, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to today's webinar, which is titled What Property Professionals Need to Know. Uh, and a special welcome to those of you who are tuning in from regional New South Wales. I suppose COVID's been good for something. Um, uh, we've become familiar with this uh, technology, and, uh, and I guess it, it helps uh, those of you who are outside uh, Sydney, you don't have to uh, travel those long distances. Uh, although um, we really are looking forward to uh, to seeing as many of you uh, as possible in person, uh, perhaps at next year's uh, Property Professionals um, Conference. Uh, so look, my name's David Kreese. Uh, I am the head of Bardia Perry's Property Planning and Construction Team. Uh, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land, uh, which are, on which I'm located today, and to pay my respects to the elders past present and emerging. Now, today's uh, webinar is going to um, be comprised of three presentations uh, by my colleagues. Um, and uh, we'll have an opportunity at the end of each session for a few, for, for a few questions uh, and also uh, at the end of the session. Um, so please, uh, any questions, pop them in that uh, chat box uh, and they'll come up and, uh, and we'll be able to respond to them. Any we don't get to, uh, we'll, be, uh, we will be able to answer by email uh, after today. Now, um, just before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items um, so you know how to participate. Um, as I mentioned, submit your uh, text questions at any time during the webinar by typing them into the box found on the control panel. Um, and uh, you'll, uh, you'll receive a copy of the slides and the recording of this event um, afterwards. Uh, we'd also appreciate if you could fill out a short survey that'll, that'll uh, come up at the conclusion of our presentation. Well, without uh, uh, delaying things further, uh, let's start with our first session. Uh, joining me will be Christy Carlisle. Christy is a senior associate in our property team uh, and Christie's uh, topic is the fundamentals of leasing and licensing council land and buildings and the special considerations that apply to telecommunications leases. Um, good morning, Christy. Good morning, David. Thanks for that. Um, so today we're going to explore council's ability to lease or license community land, the restrictions and requirements that council face, and then move on to discussing telecommunications leases and things to be aware of when negotiating with carriers. So on the next slide, you'll see that Section 36 of the Local Government Act provides that council must prepare a plan of management for community land, which categorises the land and specifies the purposes for which the land and any improvements may be used or further developed, whether under lease, licence or otherwise. Um, note that Section 36A to 36D of the Act contain restrictions against leasing or licensing community land while any amendment of a plan of management remains outstanding due to the recategorisation of land. Section 36E to 36N of the Act set out the core objectives for the management of the various categories of community land. And Section 45 provides that Council may only grant a lease or licence of community land um, in accordance with Division 2, which is encapsulates Section 35 through to 47F. Um, on the next slide, uh, you'll see the purposes for which a lease or licence of community land may be granted. And that's covered by section 41.1, sorry, 46.1 of the Act. Um, and that provides a prescriptive and definitive list of those purposes. So in the following slides, I've tried to summarise summarize those for you. Um, so A is to provide public utilities and works associated with public utilities. Um, to provide underground pipes and conduits for the connection of premises adjoining community land to a council facility or other utility provider. Um, on the next slide, B, sorry, that slide, um, B, a lease may be granted in accordance with, it, with an express authorisation in the and the applicable provisions of the plan of management uh, for a purpose prescribed in subsection 4, being the provision of public roads or the provision of goods, services and facilities and the carrying out of activities for current and future needs within the local community and the wider public. And that's in relation to public recreation, physical, cultural, social and intellectual welfare or development of persons. And then section 46.5 provides us with a list of those purposes, which includes various child related services, restaurants and kiosks. 
Overall, Council must ensure that the purpose is consistent with the core objectives of the categorisation of the land as set out in sections 36E to N. Uh, so on the next slide, and still with reference to the plan of management, um, B2, um, a lease can be granted for a purpose prescribed by the regulations if the plan of management applies to several areas. However, there's currently nothing in the regulations about this. Um, B3, for a short-term casual purpose prescribed by the regulations, and clause 116 of the regulations prescribes the events listed there on the slide, including performances, trade, sport, photography, filming, um, etc. All provided that no permanent building or structure is erected. Um, B4, uh, lease can be granted for a residential purpose in relation to housing owned by council. Or C, um, a lease can allow a filming project to be carried out, whether or not it's in accordance with the plan of management or the core objectives for the land. Um, but note the considerations set out in subsections 5A to C and section 47AA. And a lease cannot be granted for any other purpose. Um, so section 46.6 provides that a plan of management is void to the extent that it purports to authorise the grant of a lease or licence that's contrary to the criteria that we've just looked at. And section 46A stipulates that a lease or licence for a term that exceeds five years must be granted by tender unless it's being granted to a not-for-profit organisation. Um, and it requires a plan of management to specify any purposes for which a lease or licence may only be granted by tender. So, for example, council may require leases under five years for kiosks to be tendered, but perhaps not for sporting fields. Um, so on the next slide, there are some time restrictions that council has to keep in mind. Um, firstly, council must not grant a lease or licence for a period ex exceeding 30 years, including any options. This is an absolute prohibition, so the term cannot exceed 30 years, even if ministerial consent is obtained. Uh, next, minister's consent is always required if the term exceeds 21 years, including options. Um, sections 47A and uh, sorry, 47 and 47A set out the slightly different compliance requirements for leases over and under five years. So on the next slide, um, uh, I'm set, I can set out the, um, the procedure council must follow under section 47, where the term is greater than five years, including options. Um, that includes public notice and exhibition of the proposal, notice to owners occupiers of adjoining land and surrounding owners or occupiers for whom the subject land is likely to be a primary focus. Um, so the next slide shows that the notice must include certain details and must allow a period of at least 28 days for the making of submissions. And um, Council should ensure, should ensure that the closing date for submissions is consistent across all the notices that are posted in the various places they need to be. And Council must consider all submissions that are duly made to it. Um, on the next slide, you'll see section 47.5 provides that minister's consent is required if an objection is received or if the term exceeds 21 years. An application for the minister's consent must contain the details listed there on the slide, um, including council's decision on any objections, the special circumstances justifying a long term and considerations of the public interest. Note that the Act does not define what a special circumstance might support support a term exceeding 21 years. And on the next slide you'll see the remainder of section 47 provides the Minister will request a report from the Director of Planning. The Minister may consent to the grant of the lease including specifying any terms or conditions. If the Minister is satisfied that Council gave proper notice of the proposal, consent will not contravene section 46 which sets out all the permitted purposes. It is desirable to grant the lease in all the circumstances and where applicable, the term exceeding 21 years is justified by special circumstances. The Minister must provide a statement of reasons for its decision. Uh, on the next slide, section 47A applies to leases or licences which are for a term of five years or less, including options. Um, there are certain leases and licences which are actually exempt from the application of this section as set out in clause 117 of the regulations for the purposes that you can see there on the slide. Um, residential owned by council, certain utility connections, use for events including one-off and recurring events and short-term casual use of road and fire trails. 
Um, on the next slide, we can see council must largely follow the same process set out in section 47, including giving notice and considering submissions. But the key difference is that the proposal only needs to be referred to the minister for approval if council receives a written request from the minister, who is to determine whether or not the provisions of section 47.5 to 9 are to apply. And that's the procedure for obtaining minister's consent. If the Minister so determines, the parties are to deal with the proposal in the same way that they would under Section 47. Um, so the next slide shows that Section 47C pro um, uh, provides that subletting is not permitted if the permitted use under the sublease is different to the head lease. However, there are some uh, a few exemptions to this prescribed in Clause 119 of the regulations as shown on the slide there. Um, and consecutive leases. I had a council client query whether the grant of consecutive five-year leases could help to support the proposed leasing arrangement they wanted to achieve. Um, we advise council to carefully consider such an approach as, there's a, as there was likely to be a similar notice and tendering requirements. And there was a risk the minister may view the consecutive leases as a single transaction, granting exclusive possession for a period that, that exceeds the time limit. So moving on to telecommunications leases and the special considerations that apply when negotiating with carriers. As most of you are probably aware, dealing with carriers can be a pretty painful process, but hopefully we can provide you with some practical guidance. Carriers are given special statutory rights and powers, most of which are set out in sketch, Schedule 3 of the Telecommunications Act 1997, which is a Commonwealth Act. This often gives carriers a superior bargaining position when it comes to negotiating leases and licences. Broadly speaking, the Schedule 3 powers allow a carrier the right to inspect land, install a facility and maintain a facility without the con um, consent of the landowner and without requiring the landowner to be compensated, provided that the carrier complies with the requirements set out in the Act. That includes giving the required notice, doing as little damage as practicable and complying with the recognised industry standards. Certain notice must be given before each and every exercise of the Schedule 3 powers, which is often why telcos go to the trouble of negotiating a lease. So the power to inspect is quite broad and allows a carrier to enter on and inspect land to determine whether the land is suitable for its purposes and do anything that is necessary or desirable for that purpose, including the examples which appear on the slide. So on the next slide, the power to install a facility under Schedule 3 is somewhat more limited and can only be exercised uh, where a carrier has a facility installation permit, which it must obtain from the Australian Communications and Media Authority, where the carrier has not obtained all the administrative authority and approvals required under relevant state legislation. This is often a last resort for carriers as it's not a straightforward process and permits are only granted in very specific circumstances. Um, the next instance is where the facility is a low impact facility as determined by the Minister um, and the current determination is the one that you can see on the slide. Um, some facilities are excluded from being low impact, for example certain types of facilities or certain locations, um, for, um, including where the area is of environmental significance. Uh, so the next slide, the power to maintain a facility under Schedule 3 is quite broad including the right to alter, remove or repair the original facility and the right to replace the whole or part of the original facility in its original location, provided that certain prescribed conditions are met by the carrier. This right can be invoked after a lease has come to an end, which could be a problem and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, now I want to turn to a few common issues that you should consider when negotiating a lease with a carrier. We're looking at eight issues today, but you shouldn't limit your review of a potential lease to only these issues. So the first is the, the permitted use. Um, the definition of permitted use is usually drafted very broadly and will include something along the lines of what appears on the slide. Care needs to be taken in relation to this definition. Uh, the reference to land is to a defined term in the lease, which would include the whole of the land on which the facility is built and not just the leased area. Thus, by referring to the land, you may be granting rights to do things on the land outside the leased area inadvertently. Um, and we also recommend doing the words, including the exercise of any rights as set out in the Act, which is at the end there, um, as there's no need for an owner to contractually agree to this. If a carrier has statutory rights, then it can rely on them. The second is uh, 
second issue, licence that is coupled with and runs with the leasehold interest. So following on from the definition of permitted use, there will often be a clause in the lease which states that in addition to granting a lease or licence over the premises, the owner grants a general licence to the carrier over the balance of the land and the licence is coupled with and runs with the lease. This licence should be restricted, perhaps by reference to a licensed area in the plan, rather than giving the carrier free reign over the entire parcel of land. Um, failing to do so could affect your ability to deal with the balance of land in the future. So number three, reinstatement and make good. Commonly, the lease will require the carrier to remove that part of the facility located above the surface of the land upon vacating the premises. This should be resisted and the carrier should be required to remove all installations, including anything below the surface of the land, such as cables. The carrier should be required to make good back to the condition the land was in as at the date of first occupation, not the condition at the commencement date, which resets each time the lease is renewed. The carrier should also be required to pay rent until it complies with all of its make good obligations. Number four, assignment. The lease will usually permit the carrier to assign the lease, sublet, license or partly possession of the whole or part of the premises to a related body corporate or another carrier without the owner's consent. The carrier is only required to notify the owner within a period of time after the fact. Um, carriers usually require this right as they enter into co-location agreements with one another and these relationships can be complex. An owner is not privy to the intricacies of these relationships, so a carrier wants to have the freedom to deal with its lease interest without owner's consent. In our view, an owner should have control over who occupies its land. We recommend seeking that the carrier obtains the owner's consent to any proposed assignment or subletting, uh, such consent not to be unreasonably withheld, and requiring the carrier to supply certain information so the owner may make an informed decision. So the fifth issue is put, relates to subsequent occupiers. So there will often be a clause in lease which restricts the owner from granting rights to subsequent occupiers in one of two ways. Firstly, where the owner proposes to grant rights of occupancy on the balance of the land to other carriers or occupiers, which include the right to operate radio communications or telecommunications equipment. The owner must give notice to the carrier and obtain the carrier's consent where the grant is likely to adversely affect or interfere with the carrier's permitted use. This can obviously be problematic as it hinders an owner's ability to deal with the balance of the land. Also, the time involved with obtaining a carrier's consent could cause a deal to fall through. We suggest imposing a time, imposing a time frame within which the carrier must respond, deemed acceptance if no response is, is received, and limiting the carrier's, carrier's ability to request information um, and any consent is not to be unreasonably withheld. The second restriction in, a clause, in the clause usually provides that if the carrier establishes during the term that any changes to other carriers or occupants facilities are likely to adversely affect or interfere with the carrier's permitted use, then upon receipt of notice by the carrier, the owner must first arrange for the other carrier or occupier to modify its facility or the operation of it so that it no longer affects the carrier's permitted use, arrange for the relocation of other carriers or occupiers' facility so that it no longer affects the carrier's permitted use, or terminate the arrangement with the other carrier or occupier. This could be problematic if the owner has not considered these obligations when negotiating the lease terms with subsequent occupants of the land. If these rights have not been included into the subsequent occupants' agreement, then the owner could be in breach of the first agreement as it is unable to compel the subsequent occupier to take any action to cease the interference. For number six, permits and approvals, there will often be a clause which provides that the owner authorises the carrier to make applications to any relevant authority for any necessary permits, consents and approvals to enable development, construction and use of the facility. Um, must exercise and procure every right of appeal arising from the determination or failure to determine such application and must sign all documents and provide all assistance required by the carrier to obtain the necessary permits, consents and approvals. This can be problematic where a site has become contentious, for example, if it's close to a school or um, is likely to uh, cop opposition by residents. Um, it's also particularly problematic 
problematic for councils as it could be seen to require the council to fetter its powers as, as a consent authority by contractually agreeing to do what is required by this clause. Um, therefore, councils shouldn't agree to it and should ensure that there is a no fetter clause in the lease to make it clear that it's entering into the lease in, it, in its capacity other than as a consent authority. Uh, number seven, the surrender of a lease. Carriers often want the ability to terminate the lease early, say on six months notice, where factors affect the carrier's use of the premises to the extent that uh, the community is just compromised, the premises are no longer required, the level of service provided to its customers falls below a certain coverage level, um, perhaps acceptable to the carrier, or as a result of significant network changes, the facility is no longer required for the carrier's network. Um, there's an emergence of radio interference or physical interference, which in the carrier's opinion, materially interferes with permitted use or the performance of the facility. So depending on the specific drafting of such a clause, it could be a get out of jail free card for a carrier to exit a lease basically whenever it likes. Although it can be difficult to achieve, the clause should be worded so that it allows an objective assessment of whether the facility is no longer required rather than leaving that basically pure, purely based on a carrier's opinion. And perhaps also so that the right doesn't arise until say after the first say five years of the lease have, have elapsed. Commercially owners should factor this in as a 10 to 20 year lease could end up only lasting a few years. And the last point is a waiver of notice under Schedule 3, and this is an important one. Um, so it would state that the owner waives the requirement for the usual notice that the telco must provide under Schedule 3 before exercising its statutory rights. And while this may seem acceptable at face value, it requires careful consideration as the clause will usually be expressed to survive the expiry or earlier termination of the lease. So in a situation where a facility already exists, the lease comes to an end and the parties are now negotiating a new, a new lease, the carrier is in fact entitled to exercise its powers to maintain the facility under Schedule 3 without notice or the need for landowners agreement to do so. Hence, a carrier may be in no hurry to finalise a new lease, may offer a lower rent than before and may even cease neg negotiations if the parties cannot reach agreement. The carrier terminates the holding over, stops paying rent and then elects to rely on its Schedule 3 powers to maintain and the owner has no ability to object. Hence, landowners should be as commercial and reasonable as possible when negotiating new lease terms and must be aware of this seemingly innocent waiver clause, which should be expressed to cease to have effect when the lease comes to an end. So now I'll hand over to David and he is going to provide some further discussion about telecommunications leases. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christy. Um, just uh, before uh, I make uh, my comment, or a couple of comments. I notice we, if, if remember, if you have any questions, please uh, type them into the uh, into the panel there on the control uh, control panel and chat box, uh, and we'll endeavour to answer those. We'll have a couple of minutes now, and uh, and also uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, so, look, my my comment on uh, telecommunications carriers in particular is that, in my experience, um, they're pretty aggressive. Um, they know what their rights are. Obviously, um, telecommunications is, is big business these days. Uh, and so they are very, very keen to, to enforce those rights and, and will usually uh, push um, a, a landowner, in, including a council, uh, to accept their standard terms uh, and, uh, and move quickly. So uh, you really uh, need to um, be aware of the rights that you have as the landowner. Uh, and to make sure that you don't get, well, effectively pushed around uh, by these telecommunications carriers. Obviously, the last thing you want to do is is end up in the in the federal court arguing over whether rights have or haven't been um, properly uh, enforced or and, and obligations uh, met. Um, but nonetheless, my, my advice to you would be um, don't don't allow yourself to be pushed around by them, uh, and uh, and make sure that you stand up for for your rights because otherwise as Christy has has pointed out uh, there can be some uh, serious and, and difficult uh, issues uh, that arise subsequently so it's the old it's the old truism uh, prevention's better than cure now um, no questions have uh, have uh, come through oh, um, 
one question. Um, so, Christy, uh, in, in the event that you come to the end of uh, end of a telecommunications lease, the facility's still there. Um, is is the do you know is the is the carrier entitled just to walk away and leave the facility? Do they have to remove the facility? What's what's the position there? Uh, well, under the lease terms, there would be make good requirements. So the owner would have to try and enforce those uh, make good requirements. Um, if the carrier doesn't do it willingly, um, then unfortunately that means they'd have to um, commence proceedings to um, force the carrier to comply with its obligations under the lease. Right. Okay, and uh, so that's uh, something that hopefully we won't, we wouldn't uh, need to uh, need to go down that track because uh, we all know that uh, proceedings can be uh, expensive uh, and and time consuming. Uh, and that's uh, actually um, uh, quite a good segue, I think, uh, into um, our uh, our next uh, presentation. Thank you very much for that, Christy. Um, if again, if you have any questions for Christy, feel free to put them in the chat box. Uh, and if uh, if we don't get to them, uh, then we can um, uh, reply to them uh, for you uh, after the uh, after the presentation by email. So um, Sharon Levy and Rob Kelly, they're both partners in our commercial disputes team, uh, and they're going to talk to us about uh, the tender process. Uh, the do's and the don'ts. Thank you, Sharon and Rob. Thanks, David, and good morning, everybody. So we're going to start first with some general contract law discussion before we move specifically on to tenders. So firstly, the main elements of um, a traditional formation of a contract are offer, acceptance, consideration, intention and certainty. So we'll look at each of those first before we move specifically on to uh, tenders. So firstly, what constitutes an offer? So with a pledge by a party to another, promising to enter into a contract on set terms, it must be specific, uh, complete and capable of being accepted. There's no particular form required to constitute an offer unless it's for a contract for the sale and purchase of land. So therefore the offer may be made verbally or otherwise it can be in writing. In order to form a contract, the offer itself must be accepted. Uh, but offers aren't open for acceptance indefinitely and they can be revoked in a number of ways. But any revocation of an offer must be communicated to the offeree. Looking then at acceptance, so that is the unequivocal agreement to the terms of the offer without any further negotiation. The acceptance may be made orally, uh, it can be written or by conduct. Now an offer may only be accepted by the person to who it has been directed. And generally there's no particular form required for acceptance, but it must be communicated in the manner specified in the terms of the offer, uh, if the offer specifies. Now a contract is formed as soon as acceptance is communicated to the offeror. Importantly and relevant for our discussion on tenders later on, the acceptance must correspond precisely with the terms of the offer. So when an acceptance does not match the original offer, the offeree essentially is rejecting the original offer and that then become, they then become the offeror in making a counter offer. Now acceptance of a counter offer means the contract is formed on the terms of the counter offer and not on the terms of the original offer. Looking then at consideration, uh, that is the value exchanged by each party when entering into an agreement. So for example, you might have payment made in exchange for services provided. Now, if there is no consideration, then there's no contract. A party who is not who has not provided consideration for promise cannot then enforce that promise. And it's only the party who has paid for the promise who can enforce it. So that then means that only parties to a contract can enforce it. Uh, looking then at intention. So what does it mean when we say there needs to be an intention to create legal crea uh, relations? In its simplest form, 
it means that the parties must intend to enter into a legally binding arrangement in which the rights and the obligations of the arrangement are enforceable. It's the readiness of a party to accept the legal consequences of having entered into an agreement. So following on from that, for a contract to be valid, both parties must have the mental capacity to understand the terms of the agreement and the con consequences of entering into it. Looking at certainty, if an agreement is uncertain in any material respect, then it can't constitute a binding contract. The parties must deal with the essential terms of the agreement in order for that agreement to be enforceable. So an offer will only be uh, effective if it identifies with sufficient certainty the terms proposed. A promise which is illusory and therefore uncertain is unlikely to be found sufficient consideration to support exchange in an agreement. Contracts that do not have clear, comprehensive or unambiguous terms might fail for lack of certainty. So how then does all of that relate to tendering? So let's talk about the requirements for tendering and the main elements of Section 55 of the Local Government Act. So Section 55, subsection 1, lists the contracts for which council might invite tenders, or must invite tenders, I should say. The most frequent of those are a contract for the provision of goods and materials to the council, whether that be by sale, by lease or otherwise, and a contract for the provision of services to the council, and that's other than a contract for the provision of banking, borrowing or investment services. Tenders are to be invited and invitations to tender are to be made by public notice and in accordance with any provisions provided by the regulations. So what contracts do the requirements not apply to? A number of contracts the requirements do not apply to are set out in section 55 subsection 3 of the Act and include, among a number of others, a contract entered into by a council with the Crown, a contract entered into by the council with another council, a contract for the purchase of sale, leasing or licensing by a council of land, a contract for the employment of a person as an employee of the council and a contract made in the case of an emergency. And as I said, there are a number of listed in subsection three. Um, so it's good to go back and have a look at those if you're not familiar. In terms of varying a tender, it's covered by regulation 176 of the regulations. Now tenders may be varied at any time before a council accepts any of the tenders that it has received for a proposed contract. A person who has submitted a tender may vary the tender by either providing the council with further information by way of explanation or clarification, or otherwise by correcting a mistake or an anomaly. But such a variation may be made by either uh, at the request of the council or otherwise with the consent of the council at the request of the tenderer, but only if in the circumstances it appears to the council reasonable to do so. So if a tender is varied, the council must provide all of the other tenders whose tenders uh, have the same or similar characteristics, the opportunity of also varying their tenders in a similar way. A council must not consider a variation of a tender if the variation would have the effect of substantially altering the original tender. And if they do decide to vary the tender, the council must keep a record of the circumstances requiring the variation and the name of the staff member, member that was handling the matter. In terms of acceptance of tenders, it's dealt with by 178 of the regulations. So after considering all of the tenders submitted for a proposed contract, the council must either accept the tender that having regard to all of the circumstances appears to be the most advantageous or decline uh, to accept any of the tenders that they've received. Now a council must ensure if they are going to enter or accept a tender, it must ensure that every contact, contract it enters into as a result of an accepted tender is with the successful tenderer and in accordance with the tender itself. 
So that's a nice little segue into what Rob is going to speak to us about today. So I'll hand over to him. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Sharon. I'd like to take a look at the important decision in this area of secure parking proprietary limited and Wallara Municipal Council, 2016, New South Wales Court of Appeal. Before I start, I just wanna point out on the first slide, on the right-hand side, the word secure is a small typographical error. It should read council, um, but that error will be corrected when the slides are made available. The case of secure highlights the significance of all those factors Sharon just took you through with respect to both parties to a contract being aligned as to the substance of their agreement, when that agreement was formed and the precise terms of that agreement. The case also considered whether there was misleading and deceptive conduct during the tender process. In the first instance before Justice Ball, counsel succeeded in persuading the court that Secure had made an offer by its tender submission, which was capable of acceptance by counsel and was in fact accepted by counsel. His Honour found that the terms of the offer and acceptance included an agreed variation by which Secure would provide a bank guarantee for an increased amount of guaranteed income. He held that the council was entitled to terminate the contract for repudiation when Secure refused to acknowledge the existence of or perform its obligations under that agreement. He considered that neither party had engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct in their dealings with one another. The primary judge upheld the council's claim that a contract was made on 15 March 2011, which was the date of acceptance of Secure's tender offer. His Honour held that the contract was on the terms of the draft management agreement, which formed part of the invitation for tender, as varied in relation to the initial bank guarantee amount for each car park. He held that the council was entitled to terminate that contract for repudiation and assessed substantial damages for loss of the benefit of that contract and for the cost of undertaking a second tender process. The judge rejected Secure's claim that the council had engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct in failing to disclose that Woolworths redevelopment of one of the car parks included a car park of 500 parking bays where the existing number of bays was 110. Secure appealed the decision and there were six issues before the Court of Appeal. The issues on appeal were whether Justice Ball erred in the following respects. One, in finding that Secure had varied its tender offer so as to offer a bank guarantee in relation to an increased amount of guaranteed income. Two, in finding that the council's acceptance of Secure's tender corresponded with the offer. Three, in not finding that there was no contract because there was no agreement as to the commencement date of the management periods for each car park. Four, in holding that the council had not engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct by failing to disclose that the redevelopment of one of the car parks would involve an increase in the number of parking bays. Five, in not holding that Secure had engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct by representing, contrary to its actual intention, that it intended to enter into and perform an agreement in accordance with the terms of the tender conditions. Six, in not finding that Council was not entitled to terminate the contract for repudiation. Slide two, variation for tender. In relation to the first issue as to whether Secure had varied its tender offer so as to offer a bank guarantee in relation to an increased amount of guaranteed income, the court accepted that Secure had agreed to increase amounts only on the basis that they were the subject of performance bonds rather than bank guarantees. Council accepted the position in relation to performance bonds but insisted on a bond securing two months of guaranteed income instead of the usual one month. The council's acceptance was subject to a condition that an increased bank guarantee be offered, something that Secure had not agreed to offer. The question arose as to whether the parties would have understood that there was a difference in substance between what was sought by the council and what was offered by Secure. Secure had made its position clear that the distinction was significant. There was no agreement by Secure to provide bank guarantees. 
the Court of Appeal held that while there was an offer capable of acceptance by counsel as a result of the tender submission, it was not an offer varied by the amended management agreement and therefore could not accept an offer that had not been made. The court characterized the counsel's purported qualified acceptance as a counteroffer, and the court concluded that Secure's conduct and correspondence did nothing to indicate it accepted counsel's counteroffer. Sharon took you through the circumstances in which a tender may be varied. Importantly, Regulation 176 provides this can only be done before acceptance of a tender submission. Commencement date. The next issue is whether the primary judge erred in not finding that there was no contract because there was no agreement as to the commencement date of the management periods for each car park. The invitation to tender required the parties to agree to a commencement date within 14 days of council's notice of acceptance to the successful tenderer. A date of 1 June 2011 had been mooted by SECURE but was dependent on specific events occurring. Those specific events related to the installation of certain car parking equipment rather than a specified calendar date. The problem was council's acceptance was based on a commencement date of 1 June. There was no express term of the management contract between the parties, which provided for agreement as to a commencement date for the management periods within 14 days of acceptance. In the absence of that express term, the court held a term should not be implied to deal with the circumstance in which the parties failed to agree. There was no consensus between the parties as to the date for commencement. The parties accepted that it was necessary for the formation of the contract that they reach consensus as to that date. The court determined that the parties had not reached agreement on the commencement date. Next slide, please, termination. The next problem for the council on the reasoning of the Court of Appeal was that the council had purported to terminate the contract by alleging secure, had repudiated its contractual obligations by not signing the amended management agreement. Neither party relied on the existence of any earlier agreement as to the tender process as objectively conveying that they did not intend to be bound to any management contract until the draft management agreement was completed, a commencement date nominated and that agreement signed. The council's email of 15 March 2011 conveying an acceptance advised of the terms of council's resolution it enclosed a copy of the amended management agreement and attached a copy of a letter from its solicitors, which explained the changes made to the draft management agreement so as to produce that amended form of agreement. The court found that the statement in council's acceptance that the agreement enclosed reflected the terms of the offer and acceptance was not correct because it included some substantive changes which had not been agreed either in accordance with Regulation 176 or otherwise. The letter concluded with a statement that the Council and SECURE should each sign two copies of the agreement. That request was consistent with the invitation for tender. The Council's email, having referred to the letter and enclosed a revised version of the draft management agreement, sought to make clear that the latter had been amended only to reflect Council's resolution. The court found that statement was also incorrect in view of the changes made to the draft management agreement beyond those addressing the variation of the initial bank guarantee amounts. The appeal judges found that three things followed from a consideration of this correspondence from the council to secure. Firstly, that the letter and email from council proceeded on the basis that the terms of the contract of the council's acceptance of the tender offer were contained in its resolution passed on 14 March 2011. Secondly, that the amended management agreement was prepared or completed to record or reflect what was believed to be the consensus reached by that offer and acceptance. It was not proffered as forming part of that acceptance or as qualifying it. Thirdly, the provision of the amended management agreement at the time of communication of the council's acceptance was explained by the council's obligations in the invitation to tender. The Court of Appeal agreed with the primary judge's conclusion that the terms of the amended management agreement did not form part of council's acceptance of SECURE's tender offer, and for that reason did not qualify it. 
The court held that the contract which the council was insisting be performed was not the contract which the primary judge held then existed between the parties and was therefore not entitled to terminate it. Had a contract been formed, the council would not have been entitled to terminate it because it was not ready and willing to perform the agreement for its part. The court held there was no binding contract and was ordered to pay the costs of the appeal. In the decision, the next slide please. In the ultimate decision, the court held that no contract had been formed. Council was not entitled to negotiate amendments purporting to accept an original offer as binding and failed to ensure that all of the key elements for a binding contract had been resolved. And in the circumstances, it was found that council was not ready and willing to perform the contract in the terms of its original acceptance. So what are the key takeaways from this case? One, guidance and consideration as to the extent to which a request for tender needs to be completed to be enforced. Two, the very limited circumstances under which amendments can be made to the terms of a tender and the timing in which any variation can be made. Three, the rules of offer and acceptance must be adhered to. And in this respect, very importantly, making sure what is being accepted is precisely what has been offered. Four, tightly managing the tender process and ensuring that correspondence issued in relation to acceptance accurately conveys the terms of what is being accepted. An overarching consideration on the facts of this case is the context in which commercial contract negotiations are carried out. Clearly, both Secure and Council had interests specific to their needs, which each was keen to preserve. However, this case illustrates how important it is to be entirely clear about what terms each party is prepared to commit to, and for there to be relatively few essential terms of the commercial negotiations left to be agreed. After acceptance of a tender submission, it is possibly one of the best factual cases for teasing out how easily key elements of contract formation can go astray in the process of finalising the deal. Thanks for tuning in to us today. I'll now ask David if there are any questions for Sharon or I. Thank you, uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Sharon. Um, now, so questions, yes, uh, indeed, we have uh, a couple of uh, questions. Um, uh, I think this is uh, probably one for Sharon, um, but uh, Rob will weigh in, no doubt, if, if, if he feels he needs to. So um, does the tender process itself give rise to a contract? I think uh, what we're getting at here is that often um, it's said that there is a process contract that uh, is uh, comes into into uh, into existence. Um, Sharon, Rob, any comments on that? We still need to follow, and I think as Rob's case, uh, the Wallara case shows, um, we still do need to have all of the elements of a contract present. So we still need to talk about the offer, acceptance, the consideration, the certainty um, was a big one in the, the case that Rob has discussed. So um, the process um, will need to be followed and it needs to be followed in accordance with the regulations. But in addition to that, we also need to have all of the elements of the contract present. Um, so importantly, as the case showed, offer acceptance um, of the same term. So the party, there needs to be a meeting of the minds, I guess, in terms of what is being accepted and then um, a certainty of the terms. Rob, did you have Thanks, anything Sharon. to add to that? No, I think you've covered it beautifully, Sharon. Thank you. Yeah, I know in 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 my experience, um, there have been occasions uh, where uh, the tender process uh, is is followed um, or meant to be followed um, uh, occasionally, and it doesn't usually happen with with council tenders. Uh, I've got to say, but um, it it can be the case that uh, during the course of a tender. Um, if there's a particular condition of a, a tender, such as submission by a certain date, um, or the terms on, on, on which a tender will be evaluated, if, if they are departed from, then it is possible for um, usually, obviously, a disgruntled tenderer uh, to claim that, the, um, that, that they have an action because the tender process itself hasn't been followed. So again, I, I would uh, I would stress um, what 
uh, Sharon and, and Rob have been highlighting uh, in, in their presentation that um, there is a process, um, there are regulations and you really must follow those regulations. Otherwise uh, it can lead to some um, serious issues. Okay, another, another question. Um, uh, and again, I, I think this is for, for Sharon, but, um, but uh, Rob uh, can comment also. What happens if you go through, the council goes through, through the tender process uh, and um, it either doesn't receive any tenders um, that it likes and, and um, there will be a, or should be a condition of, of the tender that council doesn't have to accept any tender, um, or maybe even it doesn't get any tenders. What in, in that circumstance, um, if council doesn't accept any of the tenders that are received, can it start negotiating with um, another party or, or, or even one of the one of the tenderers, even though they uh, council didn't uh, accept the tender? Uh, thanks, David. Good question. It, if council doesn't accept any tenders, or as you say, if it didn't get any tenders, uh, council can enter into negotiations with any person. Now that person can be someone who has previously submitted a tender or it can be someone completely new, so they may not have submitted a tender. Uh, if council is going to do that though, it needs to be careful. It does need to be in relation to the subject matter of the tender. So it can't be something completely new um, or it's going to be caught by the requirements of section 55 to um, put out an invitation to tender. Um, before it does enter those negotiations though, if council, um, it needs to make a resolution to enter into negotiations, and that resolution needs to give details as to council's reasons for declining to invite fresh tenders or applications. And it also needs to state the reasons it's decided to enter into negotiations with that particular person. Okay. Rob, any comment? David, I, not, not specifically on what Sharon said, but I know today we've been focusing on uh, the issues in relation to council tendering, but Sharon and I uh, probably have more experience in the private tendering world and myself specifically with construction tendering where all of these issues come up in exactly the similar ways in which the secure case pointed out. And it's, it's amazing to see how one email or one communication that doesn't quite hit the mark and doesn't quite convey what the parties intended uh, can steer the whole process off course and 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 wind up um, land the parties in court. So I think it's uh, it's important to note that it's of much wider application than in the council tendering uh, arena. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Rob. Okay, well, um, look, we don't have any uh, any further questions presently, but again, I'll remind you if you uh, if you do have a question pop them into that chat box and uh, we'll try and answer them uh, at the end of uh, our webinar today, or we can always answer them um, after uh, the, the presentation uh, by email. So we might, uh, might, we might move on now to, uh, to our third uh, presentation today. Thanks, uh, Which, uh, oh yes, I'm sorry, uh, Rob and Sharon, I, I, I should, uh, should, should thank you. Um, Okay, so our next uh, and, and final presentation, which is uh, we're going to do it in a, in a kind of a panel format. Uh, and um, that's going to be Peter Barricade and Mark Glynn, uh, both of whom are partners uh, in our property planning and construction team. And Peter and Mark uh, are going to be discussing with, uh, with me today uh, development agreements uh, with private companies where um, there might be some underutilised council land. Uh, so waste not, what not. So um, council, it may be underutilised because council uh, doesn't have the funds or, or but uh, if some private uh, equity or some, some private funds can be uh, brought in to assist with the use of, of that land, um, that's clearly uh, to the benefit of the community. But uh, do you need to have a uh, public-private partnership or can you do it through the tendering process? Um, uh, that's what Peter and Mark are going to um, discuss today. So welcome, uh, Peter and Mark. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Um, Good morning. 
Peter, Peter, I might I, I might start with you if if that's okay. Um, so I just mentioned uh, about uh, PPPs, which is uh, something that I'm, I'm sure we're all uh, familiar with, or if not familiar, we're certainly aware of them. Um, don't developments between councils and non-government entities um, always give rise to, to PPPs? Thanks, David. Um, sometimes, but not necessarily. And it's really good to have this discussion following on from the important groundwork that uh, Rob and Sharon have just set out for us. So you'll generally have a PPP or PPP related considerations if council, uh, council owned land is involved in a particular development. Um, and what council should do is always consult the PPP guidelines, um, which have uh, been published and are available on the internet. But what they can do using the local government general regulation is structure the development by means other than a PPP. And this has been um, mandated obviously by the state government through parliament um, to provide a degree of flexibility. The two main ways in which council can structure a development other than by a PPP uh, by going to tender, as we've just been uh, listening to, or by voluntary planning agreement in connection with a development consent. Um, and as far as tendering is concerned, uh, that's a great process because what it does is it truly tests the market to ensure that the community will get the best value for its investment in the project. And what councils will typically find is when they go through the PPP guidelines is that they've really got to go through the tender process in any case, because an integral part of the PPP process is testing the market. So, and, and that's particularly important where there's more than one potential partner involved. If there is really just one partner involved um, because they're an adjoining landowner and that's going to yield the best development and nothing else is really feasible, then a PPP is probably the way to go. But going to um, the market by EOI process or by tender is legitimate, it's permitted by the regulations and it's certainly quicker and more commercially driven process than going through the PPP arrangement. Right, so um, so Peter, are they, is, would it be correct to say that um, you think the tender process is the best way to approach such developments? Depends on the circumstances. I, it, tendering generally has to be done, even if you are looking at a PPP. So um, it should absolutely be um, prepared by council and, and council should go to the market. So, so yes, it, it's essential whether you go by a PPP or just um, decide to enter into a contract with a preferred proponent through the tender process. Okay, um, so you've got this proposed, uh, this this preferred proponent um, who's a developer. I mean, look, presumably they're in it for for profit, um, and and they're obviously undertaking a certain amount of risk. Um, they'll be expending considerable amounts for financing uh, the project. Um, presumably that means that they'll want some guarantee of longevity on the site. Um, so are there any, one way I suppose of getting that is to uh, require a, a right of first refusal to uh, to purchase it. Um, is, is that an issue, Peter? Can are, are, Does that raise problems? Thanks for asking, David. Yes, it does actually. And Mark and I have just experienced this in a project that we're working on for a council at the moment. And I think to give a bit more context to this, it's important that our 
audience understands that what we're talking about here is a development project which typically results in the grant of say an agreement for lease and then a lease to the developer. This is not a tender process that we're talking about where um, which involves a sale of land. So that's why rights of first refusal come up. And following on from what Rob was mentioning just now, this is one of the reasons why it's very important to take the time to get the tender document right, to think it through, to work it out, and make sure that you don't need to change it afterwards um, because you don't want these issues arising. Now, the problem with rights of first refusal is that what they do is they preemptively bind future councils. So say a council that's going to be elected in 2030 or 2040 or 2050 or whatever. So decades in advance, they preemptively bind these councils to decisions that should be left for them to determine. Rights of first refusal are great for developers and tenants because gives them certainty about the future and helps them to do a deal based on the current market and the current commercial considerations, not about the considerations that might arise in the future when typically uh, property market is uh, well and truly ahead of where it is now. So whilst they're great for developers and tenants, they tie future councils to historic and often no longer relevant considerations. So that's a real problem for councils in commercial terms. But there are some legal considerations as well that you need to consider. And one of those things is that the power to sell land, because that's what we're talking about with a right of first refusal, giving the developer the right to buy the land before council can offer it to anyone else. The power to sell land is left to the elected council laws to make by resolution. Public authorities can't contractually disable themselves from performing their statutory duties, such as selling land in the future. We talk about this all the time in brief terms, such as not fettering council's discretion, but it's important to know that whilst that's um, a principle, and it's a very important principle, it actually has legal authority. And in Australia, it derives from a decision of Sir Anthony Mason in the High Court in the 1970s. And that litigation is um, called the Ansport Transport Industries um, litigation. So this non fetter principle is not just um, a loose notion that applies, it actually has um, authority coming from the High Court. And it's very important that councils don't bind themselves in ways that try to get themselves out of their statutory duties, whether it's with good intentions or, or perhaps not. Um, such decisions are without legal um, enforcement. So, because you can't predict what the future holds, you have to resist um, granting developers rights of first refusal. And the best way to do that is to make it crystal clear in the tender document that you just won't consider that. And then what it means is the whole market knows that. So the whole market knows when you're going to tender that what you're proposing is an agreement for lease where the structure will be built. And following on from that, a lease pursuant to which they will hold the site and council can derive an income from it for whatever the set term is. And that's really important. And you just don't want to, you just want to ensure that you don't bind yourself and, and get yourself into this problem. Because what's going to happen is if you do grant a developer a right of first refusal, it's not going to get the best value for money at the time based on the prevailing market. If you want to know a little bit more about this, what I recommend you do is have a look at the ICAC guidelines. They're the direct negotiations guidelines and they help you to manage risks in these um, circumstances. And what they do is they sort of um, 
amplify what we've just been discussing by requiring government agencies, which include local councils, to avoid what's called exclusive dealings with a counterparty without first going through a competitive process. So the ICAC guidelines absolutely love competitive processes because it avoids doing sweetheart deals. It ensures that the market is tested, you get the best value for money. And it's a fundamental um, anti-corruption principle. And, and rights of first refusal do the opposite. They absolutely prevent competition. It's the exact opposite to what councils are required to do. So I'd just like to reiterate that in the actual tendered document, you should explicitly rule out the prospects of rights of first refusal because if you if you don't do that, and the developer is um, is uh, assessed and appointed, this um, issue will arise, and you'll find that you'll have a very difficult discussion that you're going to have trouble getting yourself out of. Thanks, Peter. Some some great advice there. Topical advice as well. Um, you know, ICAC's uh, pretty much. Uh, uh, firmly in, in most people's minds at the moment. It's the uh, best show in town, better than Netflix. Um, you can give up your Netflix subscription and uh, and have a look and see what's happening uh, with the former Premier. Um, okay, and sweetheart deals indeed. Um, so uh, just to get back on the topic, um, tender documents, you, you, you were talking about those, uh, Peter, and, and, and what's important with respect to uh, rights of first refusal uh, or the exclusion of rights of first refusal to make that clear in the 10 documents. What are the other things that council needs to think about in terms of um, the tender documents, the things to deal with um, when they're seeking these expressions of interest or, or calling for tenders? What, what are the important other, what are some of the other important issues that need to be addressed by these documents? Thanks, David. The first thing I would say is make sure you've got a good probity advisor somebody who's experienced, practical, understands the framework within which you operate, and somebody who's got a little bit of commercial nows, and that will, that will help you prepare and structure the, docu the document and um, ensure that the process goes through properly so you just don't have these problems that, that Rob was talking about, um, queries about contractual formation and the, and the like. Um, so a couple of issues to answer David's question specifically is, and after practicing in this area for over 15 years, I'm still astonished in every transaction I have, <laughs> developers are trying to bind councils in their capacity as consent authorities. They just don't get it. the fact that councils are, uh, complex organisations who have a number of duties and who perform a number of functions as the Local Government Act provides. And they can own land and they can deal with land just as any of us can. But they also are consent authorities and regulatory authorities. And as far as those statutory roles are concerned, they can't be bound, as we've just discussed, to exercise or perform their statutory duties in a particular way. So you've really got to be careful in your tender documents that you have an no fetter clause and that you make it very, very clear that anything that relates to the development consent process is not something that you can predetermine in the tender process or even in the agreement for lease and lease. So that's one thing that's absolutely critical. And if they want to um, secure plan, if they want to secure planning outcomes, then the appropriate way for them to do that is in the VPA process. The VPA process allows that, but outside that process and outside the development consent process, they can't do it. It's a problem for you because it creates an illegal fetter on your discretion. It's also a problem for them because um, you can't be held to it, but you don't want to get embroiled in issues over contractual representations and the like. And the other thing is 
that I'd, I'd, I'd like to point out, and I think that this is very important, it's certainly been important in the past two tender documents that I've worked on, is that you want to try to draw out as far as possible from the prospective proponents any conflicts of interest that might arise, um, and you want to get declarations of them up front. I mean, as David's rightly said, our illustrious former Premier is now um, in hot water um, because of a relationship that she didn't declare. Um, and you don't want that. So what I often do and advise my clients to do in these situations is list out in the tender document all the different types of conflicts that can arise. Relationships with the staff, relationships with the counsellors, you name it. Just list it out because it's easy for tenderers to follow and to respond to in their response. And then you know exactly where you stand. It makes the job of the probity advisor much easier as well. So there are a couple of key considerations that I think that you need to tease out in the tender document. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Peter. Um, Mark, I, I must apologise. I, I kind of left you sitting in the background there and, um, and, and haven't, haven't given you any work to do so far. So um, question for you, yeah. Mark, and, and perhaps we can go to, uh, go to practical examples. So you've, you've been involved in, in, in this area, advising and, and drafting in these kinds of, a, of agreements, um, and, and obviously without identifying a particular project, can you um, give us some idea of what are the what are the challenges faced uh, as you work through through these projects? What are the what are the pinch points? I, I guess you, you might you might call it in your experience. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, and good morning, everyone. So, if I just backtrack a, a little bit, if I may. So, having met all your statutory and probity obligations that Peter's mentioned, you've made your uh, issued your invitation to the market, and so councils would hopefully be uh, dealing with one or, or maybe more uh, submissions. And those submissions invariably are, are very exciting projects. So they bring investment and jobs and uh, services and, and, you know, in some instances, improve standards of living to the uh, to council and to its LGA. And as David said, we've been lucky enough to assist uh, on a number of these projects and they're all different. They're all different what they bring. but in negotiating these deals there's one generally i would say one consistent characteristic and that's the inherent tension that exists between a council as the asset owner and the developer who's going to be investing significant amounts of money and uh, assuming significant risk and liability over the course of the development and when i talk about that tension what do i mean developers want flexibility so they want flexibility in what's the development that they'll be allowed to, to build or develop, how they to, can develop a, a council's land. They want flexibility in, in the use of that land. They want flexibility to bring other parties into the transaction. So often they, depending on whether it's stage development, the developer may want the right to bring other developers or other nominated developers into the project. As Peter said, invariably these lead to a lease being granted. They may want to bring other lessees into the transaction. And the developer itself may not in fact be the tenant or the occupier of council's land. It may just be the developer. Similarly in and around design, the developers want some flexibility around design. The tension that I referred to is that what councils want or need is certainty. They want to make sure that the development that comes in is aligned to the council's vision for the LGA or their management or master plan. They want to have some influence. I use the word influence as, a, as opposed to control. They want to have some influence over the design of what's going to be proposed and built there. Because council's got all the usual obligations of needing not only the, the needs and expectations of their residents, but also the requirement that it achieve a commercial return as well as meeting all these statutory and probity obligations that Peter mentioned. So there is this tension that exists. And whilst, as I say, all projects are different, we often find that there's that one characteristic of that tension. Now, having said that, and having worked on a couple of these projects, this is a tension and, and, and a, a gap between the parties that can be bridged. 
and, and there's no problem doing that. It often just takes a little bit of negotiation and particularly an, an acceptance by both parties of the differing positions that the other comes from. So you've got council with its uh, obligations, be they statutory and expectations of their communities versus the private industry and private industry profit motives and that of the, of the proposed developer. So in, in saying that, probably the first point to start when you're looking at these developments is to look at what is the project management process or method that's going to be adopted. I mean, the develop the proposals will come through, they may be very different, as I said, but they may involve council undertaking the actual development to meet to, to build or construct a building to the agreed standard of design and quality, and then entering into a lease of not only the land, but also the building with the incoming tenant. Or alternatively, it might be that the tenant carries out the development with a view to council just entering into a ground lease with the tenant for, for the land. Or the third example might be where the developer uh, carries out the development work. And then at the end of the work, the building is handed back to the uh, council and council may in some instances reimburse the developer for the costs of that development and then enter into a lease that reflects the fact that council has assumed the cost for that development. So what will be teased out very early in the proposal is to what is the project delivery method. And once that's agreed upon, then depending on, on how that falls out, then there are a number of issues that, um, that will need to be addressed. What we've found in this is that there are certain characteristics to these types of deals and these influence what I've referred to earlier as the, as the pain points that need to be addressed and need to be the subject of some negotiation. Often these deals involve long rights to occupy. So often we see the developer coming in, investing multi-millions of dollars, taking on significant risk, either the development of, of an individual stage or a stage with rights to develop other stages in the fullness of time. And invariably the developers as a result of entering, taking this significant risk, want to enter into long-term leases. So we often see proposals that come forward to councils for leases, you know, 50, 80, up to 99 years. And you can imagine that in those circumstances where you're looking to enter into any sort of contract that's gonna run for uh, that significant period of time that that will uh, raise some issues that need to be addressed. Similarly, as I touched on, there might be stage development. So in a, a development agreement that's reached may involve the development of say for stage one, and then with rights to develop further parcels of land that council may own. And that, it, that again involves some uncertainty for, on council's part, because often what the developers want to do in retaining the flexibility is that they want to retain the right to bring other developers in for future, for future stages of work, or they want to, retain the right to bring in other lessees. There may be financiers involved. They, they, they don't really know who's going to be the party. They've got a vision as to how a, an area may look, but at this stage, they may not have been able to secure the, the uh, input or involvement of subsequent developers under their original development agreement that they've secured with council. So the developer may in fact be a, a developer in the generic sense of the word, the developer may be a real estate development and management company who will develop council land with a view to then going and securing tenants or occupiers of the land, or it may in fact be a business that wants to develop and use the land in its own right. So again, there's a lot of those issues around determining who's going to be the developer and the developer of the original agreement always, as I say, wants the flexibility to bring other parties into the transaction at any point in time. This leads to Obviously, when you're talking about lease periods of you know, 50, 80, up to 100 years, the issue of what is going to be the permitted use, because again, the, the developer and or the tenant wants to retain a significant amount of flexibility as to what the land and the development can be used for. Council, on the other hand, want to have some sort of certainty as to what the use is going, what use is going to be made of the development so that it fits not only within their community expectations, but within their master and management plans that they have for the area. So again, we find the permitted use is often an area that is subject to much discussion. Similarly, with these types of transactions, developers always want to retain flexibility in terms of the design and the construction. 
Now, again, if you look at it from their point of view, you can understand that that is a, in some times that's a reasonable request because, it, you know, they're investing millions of dollars. They're taking on a right then to or an obligation to occupy that developed site for, let's say, you know, 80 odd years. But at the same time, council has an obligation and also wants to maintain some sort of influence over the design process. Similarly, when you're looking at rights of occupation or leases for 50 and 80 years, those leases invariably contain clauses allowing for redevelopment at some point in time. And buildings have a, an asset life, and often that the, uh, the occupiers, the, the lessees may wish to redevelop the land in the fullness of time. The issues arise as to what should be the standard and the design criteria for any of this redevelopment work that may in fact be taking place in, you know, again, as I say, 50 or 60 years time. So there are a number of issues, David, um, that, that arise. I'm happy to touch on a couple of those if you, if you think that's appropriate, um, just for the benefit of the audience. Yes, Mark, if you, if you would mind, just uh, yeah. perhaps a couple of short points. Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned a couple of times, one of the issues that the developers will always come to the table with is invariably looking for long leases. So that brings into play a number of issues that again are the subject of some discussion and negotiation. You've got to look at issues as to how the rent's going to be adjusted across the next 80 year time period, for example, be it by CPI or market reviews, which are always a, a, a sticking point or a discussion point, shall we say, in the negotiation of any lease. You look at what security is going to be provided and whether the security that you take at the beginning of the lease is likely to be relevant in the fullness of time, again, across this extended period of time, or does the security need to be adjusted? If it is in the case of a bank guarantee, it needs to reflect the existing rental at the time and, and what that might be in the fullness of time. And the developers will push back and say, well, you know, very difficult to get bank guarantees that have got an expiry date of 80 years into the future. So there are issues in and around that. Again, when you're looking at long-term leases, invariably there will be clauses involving assignment and ovation of the, of the lease. And again, because of the, the long lease tenure, you're obviously looking at criteria that uh, needs to be met for any incoming lessee. Again, the developer will want great flexibility. Council as the landowner will want to have some sort of control and have some criteria that an incoming tenant must meet. And again, there needs to be some sort of discussion around identifying those that criteria because a developer is not really going to enter into an 80 year lease on the basis that it can be assigned at the discretion only of, of council. So what we're finding is that developers are saying, okay, we want the right to uh, assign, but council, we want you to give us the criteria that we must bring to the table if we're going to introduce an incoming tenant or an assignee to the, to the lease. I touched on permitted use. Again, developers want wide and flexible rights as to the permitted use of the land. Council, on the other hand, often want to be able to have some degree of control as to what that might be. Now, what, what might be an appropriate or acceptable use today may or may not be an acceptable or appropriate use in 50 or 60 years time as, as, as things change. So that invariably leads to some discussion and excuse me, some negotiations. And, and these are all obstacles that arise, but they are all obstacles that when both parties take a fairly pragmatic view and an understanding of the position of the other party, that some common ground can be reached and that the appropriate regimes can be built into the documents. Similarly, on the issue of design, developers have got an idea of what the design is going to look like. They've also got in the back of their mind that in the event that they do redevelop at the end of the asset lifespan, what the development might look like. Council, on the other hand, does not necessarily want to be involved in the design process, but it has certain requirements. It has to fit the design of this development in keeping with its master plan for the, the council or its management plan for the LGA as a whole, and wants to have some influence over what the design will look like. Again, that requires a little bit of negotiation because the developer simply says, well, you know, it's our money, we are developing it. And council says, well, yes, we have certain obligations that we have to meet, as I said earlier, not least of which is the expectation of our, our community. So again, there are the documents, these development agreements and the leases will have regimes built into them for the design process, allowing councils to approve. What we're finding is that developers want to, 
include basis on which the um, council can approve the design. Now, I just stressed to Peter's earlier point, this is approving the design in your capacity as a landowner and not as a consent authority. We often get pushback from the developer saying, well, you know, you, you have this right of, of when the DAs are submitted in your capacity as a consent authority, which goes to Peter's earlier, earlier point. But in this instance, we always make it quite clear that council under these agreements is acting in its capacity as the landowner, because notwithstanding that council as a consent authority has the input and the, makes a determination under the DA process, that of course can be and often is subject to to uh, referral to the courts and takes the decision making process out of out of council's hands. So we're finding that the, these documents provide relatively prescriptive design criteria, and often the criteria might be that the uh, that the design is in keeping with an agreed master plan. But of course, master plans develop and evolve over time. And again, if you're looking at what the design might be of a redeveloped site in the fullness of time, the master plan that might be attached to the document some 50 years prior might not be any might not be relevant. So what we've found is we found ways working with council, working with designers, working with the developers to incorporate some other base threshold criteria that might be in the form of guidelines that governments publish. Again, Peter referred to the ICAC guidelines. There are also guidelines, as you'd all be aware of that uh, provides you know, guidance on architectural and other types of issues. And maybe those sorts of guidelines can be used to guide the criteria of any future design, as I say, which may be uh, the subject of discussion in the, in the fullness of time. So councils, again, want to retain some influence. Developers want great flexibility and developers say, well, listen, if you want to have some influence, you've got to give us some criteria. The other thing is to look at whether there's any other benchmark buildings or similar developments that can be used as a benchmark for the quality and the, and the, the design. So often some of these projects may involve quite specialised developments, you know, so by way of example, you might use have a, a racetrack, so you might be able to provide a, a, a some drafting that provides that the quality in the design will be in keeping of what's required for a certain standard of racetracks. Similarly, around aviation, there are some benchmark buildings that um, that can be can be incorporated into the document to provide some guidance as to what will or will not be an acceptable design, and secondly, a an acceptable standard of quality of the building. And again, go back to my original discussion around the project delivery method, who's, who's going to own the building at the end of the day? Does council need to have some rights into the document to be involved in, for example, the practical completion process of issuing the certificates of practical completion? Because if, if at the end of the day, or at the end of the build, the building is actually going to vest back or be transferred back to council for council to own, then obviously council needs to have had some involvement in issuing and determining that practical completion has been reached. Also, need council needs to be protected and ensure that it has the benefit of any warranties that may have been issued on throughout the construction process. So they're the sorts of issues that, that, that will arise. They're always made a little bit more difficult because, as I say, that inherent tension between council on the one hand wanting to have some control and some influence versus the developer saying, well, listen, we're assuming we're investing significant amounts of money we're taking on significant liabilities over long, long periods of time and bringing great benefits to the people of, your, of council and uh, to, to council and to the people of the LGA, and therefore they want to resolve, retain a, a significant amount of flexibility. Th those are the just a couple of the points of pain as I've had heard them referred to in more than one occasion. It's worth saying that um, council should not be scared off by having to deal with those, as to as not be scared off with having to agree on a permitted use that's going to stand up for the next 80 years or agree on design or construction criteria or redevelopment criteria that may be called to question in 50 or 60 years time. You know, as I said, with both parties accepting the position from which the other is coming from and their respective but differing uh, objectives and requirements that with some, some a little bit of goodwill and some uh, otherwise good, good, honest tussling and negotiations invariably a uh, an agreed position can be can be landed on and the projects can 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 get out of the ground. 
Thank you, Mark. Some great, great food for thought there. Um, obviously, this is a significant topic, and 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 we can't cover everything in the in the time we have in in one of these presentations. We've got about a minute left. There's there's a few questions come through, and as I've said to uh, said to you all uh, earlier, we will answer all your questions that we don't get to by email. Might just take one quick question, um, and that is in in terms of um, the commercial risks associated with first rights of refusal, can that be dealt with or managed via an appropriate valuation process? Thanks, David. Very difficult to do that, I think. Um, and rights of first refusal uh, tend to be drafted on, on different terms. There's no standard way of drafting it, you'd have to draft the clause very carefully. And what happens with some of them is that if the developer doesn't want to buy the property, doesn't want to exercise the right, council goes to market, doesn't have any success, the right of first refusal revives and council can be stuck having to sell to that developer only. It's very difficult, as Mark's been saying, you know, we're dealing about these rights are rising in, in 50 years time. How are you going to work out now in valuation terms, what's going to be applicable in, in 50 years time? You just have to have a look at all the compulsory acquisition cases and how they're changing so much on a daily basis. Methodologies that are applicable now may not be relevant in 50 years time. Um. You need that crystal ball, don't you, Peter? That's uh, that's what it's all about. <laughs> that's right, David. Okay, ladies. <laughs> all right, ladies and, and, and gentlemen, thank you uh, for your attention today. We've um, we've we've run out of time. Um, uh, once you leave the webinar, you'll receive a short survey on the presentation. If you wouldn't mind, we'd we'd certainly appreciate your feedback. Uh, as I said earlier, also you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to view a recording of today's webinar, uh, and uh, you'll also get the slides. We'll also be answering uh, any questions we didn't get to, and there are a few, uh, by email. So uh, look, on, on behalf of Badia Perry, um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day.